I was online and I found three of the most ridiculous lawsuits that I have ever heard. You guys ready to hear some? Number one, there was somebody that sued because there was too much empty space in Junior Mint boxes. So Biola Daniel and Abel Duran of New York, they believe that Tootsie Roll Industries was jipping them. And they believed that the company was purposely underfilling Junior Mint boxes, and so they sued the company. But the judge obviously dismissed the case in a 44-page decision and said, any reasonable customer can expect some empty space in your Junior Mint box. So they obviously lost that. It's pretty wild, right? Or the, how about this one? Man sues himself for $5 million. This one's creative. There's prison inmate Robert Brock, and he was serving time for breaking and entering. And so he decides to sue himself, claiming that he violated his own religious beliefs and got himself arrested. And since he had no income and he was in jail and technically a ward of the state, the state had to pay. <laughs> Creative. But the judge said, no, that's not how this works, buddy. And he threw the case out. Or how about this one? If you got, okay, ladies, if you are single and you are in this type of relationship, you need to run. Man sues dates for being on her phone too much. This is real. So 37 year old from Austin, Texas sued his ex-girlfriend, emphasis on the ex part, because he was offended she was texting on her phone while on a date watching Guardians of the Galaxy. He claimed that he endured pain and suffering because she ruined his movie experience. And the ex-girlfriend said, here's the money for my ticket for $17, and I never want to see you again. And miraculously, the case was dropped. Now, we have all these crazy lawsuits, and you'd be surprised to know, while the U.S. is a very litigious society, it's not the worst. We're actually number five in the world, so we're up at the top, but... Actually, Germany is number one per capita, in case you want to know, a little factoid. But we have to ask ourselves, why are we even talking about this? It's because in 1 Corinthians 6, as Paul is going through and addressing various issues in the church, he's going to address lawsuits. Because the Corinthians, like they were messing up in most areas in life, they were messing up in this area. And it begs the question, can a Christian sue somebody else? Can a Christian sue another Christian? Is it okay for a Christian to go to court? Well, we're going to answer all those questions in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And what we're going to discover is that there is more under the surface to this issue than we realize. So Paul is addressing these specific issues in the Corinthian church. We had divisions and church discipline last week that we were talking about where people were gravitating to certain individuals. Like, I follow Paul. I like Paul's teaching. I follow Apollos. I like the way Paulus does things. And Paul is just saying, guys, you're all on the same team. You're on team Jesus. You just need to cut that out. And then we talked about church discipline last week, where the church in Corinth was proud of somebody sleeping with his stepmom. Really gross. But they were proud of that because they were being gracious or progressive. And Paul says, no, this is how you need to handle it. This is what really go is going on. And then Paul goes into the next issue. He's just nailing them. Next one is lawsuits. So pick it up with me in chapter 6, verse 1 of Corinthians. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Here's what was happening. The Corinthian uh, Christians, they were very litigious because they were in Greek culture. Greek culture was actually quite litigious. Now remember Paul's background. Paul himself was a lawyer. So when Paul is speaking about these issues, he actually has some real world experience in this whole area of law. And why is Paul so upset about the Corinthians suing each other? We'll read on verse two. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more then matters pertaining to this life? And you might be thinking, what, what, what is Paul talking about? He's talking about at the end of time, that when Jesus comes back in the thousand year reign, it's the end of Revelation, that some of us, actually a lot of us, will co-lead with Jesus 
and we will judge as magistrates in that thousand year reign. And I want to be very careful when we talk about this, because a lot of people try to fast forward this concept to today. It's like, it's not now. It's when Jesus comes back and Jesus is not obviously back. So obviously we're not in charge. But Paul is saying this, there are spiritual issues that you're going to judge. You're going to judge angels, but you can't even figure out these, these physical cases or these earthly cases. And these judges that you're going to be is that you're going to have to follow God's word. You're going to have to follow the principles. You're going to have to have the wisdom to do that. And Paul is saying, guys, if you can't even handle this stuff now, how are you going to even handle the stuff later? It provides amazing perspective for us. It's like this. Let's say that you have this lawsuit and you're upset because somebody didn't pay you for a job. And so you, you, and it's fellow Christian, it's Christian to Christian. And so you're like, you didn't pay me the 500 bucks, da, 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 da. And there's a legitimate case here. I'm not talking about silly, frivolous cases like what we started with. Like a lot of these things that Paul's going to discuss is actually very legitimate cases that have to be dealt with, but he's going to show you how to deal with it. So you're worried about the 500 bucks, but later in the thousand year reign of Christ, the Bible says that we're going to judge angels, judge angels, particularly fallen angels. So if you can't handle the $500 issue, how are you going to handle the issue of this angel chose not to follow God and caused all this spiritual mayhem and destruction and caused five souls to go to hell? Like, how are you going to handle that one? You know what I'm saying? Like, it's a matter of perspective where Paul is saying, guys, like you got to keep this in perspective and don't let the unspiritual person, unbelievers tell you as Christians how to handle this. That's not where you start. Verse four. So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between brothers? Paul is saying, so there's nobody smart enough to figure this out. Like none of your friends can help you. Really? Are you, well, he, says, he says this to their shame, verse six, but brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers. Paul here is saying that we should not go to the courts. And this is, this is how you interpret this passage as we unravel this. Christians are suing Christians, which is terrible when you think about it. It's absolutely terrible. Paul, remember in 1 Corinthians 5, was talking about church discipline, and we were talking about Matthew 18 and the right way to handle conflict in church. Matthew 18 is an amazing way to settle issues. So before you rush to court, have you followed the Matthew 18 steps? Have you talked to them one-on-one and told them what's really going on? Have you followed the next step if that didn't work and you talked to them and you brought another person with you and say, hey, can we figure this out? Have you talked to somebody that's wise in the church? Maybe they're a leader in the church to help you solve this conflict as opposed to a random person. This is the thing that Paul is getting at. They skipped over the steps of classic conflict resolution and they let unbelievers tell them how to handle spiritual things. And Paul is not happy about this. Because he's saying, guys, there are so many reasons why this is a bad idea. There's so many reasons why you should take care of this one-on-one. You should take care of this with Matthew 18. And Paul pokes at the motive here. He's saying, guys, it's more important to be reconciled with your brother than to win in court. That's what's more important. And as we go through this, there's going to be legit cases. And I know some of you may have even been in legit cases where there is tremendous hurt and they're, and you're looking for justice. And Paul isn't saying don't do anything. What Paul is going to say is this is how you handle it. This is the order of priority because as Christians, we need to think about the spiritual first, not the physical. And verse seven, To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. That's a crazy statement. The fact that Christians are suing Christians, it's you've already lost. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? Paul is saying, have you considered just letting it go? (laughs) Have you considered walking away? These are the things that Paul is talking about. And Paul is even to have a lawsuit with another Christian is a, is a bad thing because it's a bad example. 
Imagine, now I'm, let me give you a little bit of context. In the Greek culture, the way that they would do their lawsuits and their court stuff, it was all public. Anybody could come and hear you air your dirty laundry against another person. It's kind of like Judge Judy, but in real time for everybody to see. And the juries in these court systems, sometimes they would be 10 people, sometimes they'd be 20 people, but the average size of a jury in Greek culture was 40 people. And because it was public, the Greeks loved a good argument and they would come and they would watch the show. There was even some accounts in history of a jury of a thousand people. Could you imagine the chaos of that type of lawsuit? It's like, ah, it's a mob. It's a show. And Paul is saying, guys, when you as a Christian and you have your other brother that's a Christian and you, and you rush to court and you air all this dirty laundry in front of everybody and they're like, hey, are those, those, those Jesus people? And then when you turn around and say, yes, would you like to invite Jesus Christ into your life? You can be just like me. They'll say, no, thanks, because I heard all of your dirty laundry in the last court case. You see what I'm saying? Imagine a Christian suing another Christian on a reality court TV show, and it is super nasty. What kind of a witness is that? It's terrible. It's absolutely atrocious. And these cases at Corinth, Paul wants us to ask the, this question. What if you just let it go? What if you just walked away? I don't think that's the automatic response to every single thing because I, we're going to get into it. I do believe that there are some legitimate things that you might need to pursue. But what you need to do first, it's Matthew 18. Have you gone through the process of Matthew 18 where you've talked with them, you've tried to figure it out, you've tried to settle, you've tried to come to, to a, a peaceful resolution? Bible says, blessed are the peacekeepers for they shall be called the sons and daughters of God. Have you tried that before you rush to court? before we rush to those options. If you get sued, or can I sue a non-Christian? Like, what should I do? And I'm gonna give you, this is gonna sound like a cop-out answer, but it really isn't. It all depends on what you should do. It really does depend. There's a lot of factors at play. And there are some people here, and there's some people that are online, that have experienced tremendous injustice, even at the hands of other Christians. And I'm not going to pretend to ignore those things. We just need to handle them in the right way and the right fashion. In a rights-focused, litigious, civil lawsuits abounding to society, Paul asked the question, what if you just let it go? Is that an option for you? I think that's a good option to ask. I have a personal example of this. When we were doing house remodeling, this was our... I forget how many houses ago. They, they all blur together. But anyways, we were, we were redoing the master bath and we had just finished, uh, we had just finished the, the flooring and the basin case and, and a whole bunch of electrical work in the master bedroom. It, we just finished it and then we were starting to focus on the master bath. And this plumber came in because I hate plumbing. I'll do everything else except plumbing. I hate it. I should probably learn plumbing, but I don't want to, so I don't do it. And he came in and he made a terrible mistake. And in the nights, a pipe just burst and flooded our whole master bath and our whole master bedroom that we just finished literally eight hours before. And I'm thinking, all right, and it's not my first rodeo. So I'm like, okay, like, let's, let's figure this out. So I talked to the guy and be like, hey, like you did this thing and it wasn't right. Now I understand accidents happen, but could we come to some sort of resolution here? Cause I'm, I'm, we did all this work. I'm out of pocket a thousand bucks. It's like, how about we come to some sort of arrangement? And I, I didn't even say what the arrangement was. You know what he told me? He basically gave me the middle finger and told me to go pound sand. And I'm like, oh, okay. So that's how this is going to go. And I thought to myself, should we sue him? Like, you know, should we do that? And you know what my wife and I did? We let it go. We, we could have, because he also did some other things that let's just be honest, were not great and they were not to code and everything else. And so he obviously, we fired him obviously, but we're like, what should we do? I was like, you know what? Can we let it go? And the answer was, yeah, we can do it. We can let this go. We can forgive. 
Again, Paul is not advocating that things remain unsolved, but Christians should go through this Matthew 18 process. And I just want to give you some clear clarifications here as to what this means. So there is there's authority that the Lord has given. The Lord has obviously given authority in the church, but the Lord has also given authority to governments because we do have court systems established by the Lord, whether they're perfect or not, they're obviously not, but the Lord has said, hey, in Romans 13, that we submit to government. But the church needs to abide by the laws of Christ and then by the laws of the land in that order. And so we want to be careful of those things. Christians do utilize and participate in secular judicial systems. We do, and there's Bible verses to support that. But I want to, I just gotta, I just gotta say this really quick. When the church thinks that they're above the law of the land that the Lord has put forward, that's when you actually get into some trouble. Not that they're following the law of Christ, they're just following their own law. We want to be careful of those things. We want to abide by the law of Jesus and the law of the land. But God does encourage us to defend the, the weak and the helpless. Isaiah 117, learn to do right, seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the father, fatherless, plead the case of the widow. Christians that participate in the legal system to defend the rights of widows, to, to defend against the imbalance of power for the poor, the, the orphans, the, the Bible calls it sojourners, we would translate to be immigrants, this is all biblical stuff to help those people. I mean, I'll give, you, I'll give you another example. There was a gal, she was 80 years old and she was a widow. And she lived in this house for a super long time. And there were new people that moved in next door and she had planted along her property line a whole bunch of plants and different things. And the people that moved in next door took her to court to try to move the property boundary line like four feet over. And somebody might say like, what's the big deal? And I'm thinking like, well, okay, it's this 80 year old widow on social security. And then these hot shots come in and try to push her around. Like, I think that's when you should probably stand up for the widow. Be like, what are you guys doing? Like, knock it off. Like, that's not okay. See, there is a justice element to it. Paul also used a right to appeal to Caesar. You guys remember that in the book of Acts that we covered last year? He was in dire straits. He was, his life was being threatened. And so he used the Roman judicial system to save himself, and he appealed to Caesar. He didn't do it to get rich. He didn't do it to cheat people out of money. He did it wisely because he knew what was at stake. And just like Paul, if you're being attacked by unbelievers and serious things where your life is in danger, there are times to wisely use the judicial system but only after you've exhausted all other options. I believe when you look at the entirety of Scripture that the Lord desires peace. The Lord desires people to get along and to not fight each other. Can you sue, as a Christian, another Christian? I believe that when Paul is talking about here, these people were rushing to court cases. They weren't trying to even Matthew 18 anybody. There is a saying, though, that when you go to court, nobody wins. And that is true. When you look at everything that happens with your, with your mental health when going through a court case, with the amount of time that you spend on it, with the amount of resources that it takes, I think you really need, honestly, to count the cost. Because Matthew 18 first, that needs to happen first, and there are some legitimate cases that you might need to pursue, but you need to ask yourself these questions in counting the cost. Number one, can I let this go? Can I just walk away? I would highly encourage you to consider some of those options, but sometimes you can't. Sometimes that's not an option. You need to ask the question, is this some sort of imbalance of power issue that needs to be, that needs to be justified that the Lord says that maybe I'm, I want to do this on behalf of somebody else that is, is less than, or maybe they're a widow or they're an orphan, or do I, am I doing this in protection of somebody else? That's a good question to ask. You need to also ask, what's this going to do to my relationships with this person? How is this going to affect my Christian example to my friends and my family and the people I work with? Those are good questions to ask. 
if you go at the end of all these things and you're like, you know what? I do believe that per scripture that this is, I need to do this. It's the last resort option and there's no bitterness in your heart and you're just thinking, you know what? I just need to do this. I think you need to take it on a case by case example and a case by case basis. But I do think that there are grounds for that. But I will say this, Paul very clearly says, do not rush to this. You need to seek peace and seek reconciliation. For those of you that might be in a lawsuit right now, I don't know. And you might be thinking, oh, now what do I do? <laughs> seek counsel from friends and family that are wise in the scriptures. Seek counsel as to what you do from here. I mean, we're available. I always highly encourage people when they've gone through the Matthew 18 steps and there is an impasse and there's nothing that you can do and you really do feel called by the Lord. It's not going to affect relationships. It's going to help some other people out. It's going to do those types of things. You've, I highly encourage settling outside of court and doing some sort of Christian mediation. Highly recommend that. And that's the last resort, right? Don't rush to that. That's the absolute last resort. You need to really look at what is my priority? Is it physical, what's in front of me, or is it spiritual? What am I trying to get? What is my goal? And the last thing that I would also ask when you count the cost with these kind of things, what if that person is not a Christian? They, their soul, let's just be honest, their soul is worth more than that lawsuit. You got to weigh those things in the balance and make a decision going forward. Now, Paul, enough about lawsuits, moving on to the next thing. Now, Paul, he shifts to the characteristics that the Christians should have. And then he also gets into this whole litigious, you know, mindset of a swindler. But he lumps that in with a whole bunch of other bad actors and bad characters. So pick it up with me in verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous, and this is kind of a crazy verse, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That is a very strong statement. When you look at that list, you're thinking, oh my goodness, like, you, you, might, you might find yourself in this list. But we need to look at it that those that, that do these things, this is a lifestyle choice. This is a lifestyle of sin. This is not a person that falls into it. We talked about this last week in 1 Corinthians 5. These are characteristics that mark a person's life. And when they mark a person's life as a, as a greedy person, as somebody that is a gossip and tears people down all the time, that is a drunk, that cheats people out of business, all of these characteristics, we know this, that they are constantly rejecting what God wants for them. And so what happens is that they are choosing not to follow what God wants. Constantly. And that's the key phrase here. You look at the sexually immoral, that's anything outside sex outside of marriage. You look at idolaters, people worshiping something other than God, or adulterers, that's married people having sex outside of marriage. And then it talks about homosexuality. And for those people that, that struggle with homosexuality, I know this is a very sensitive topic, but the Bible is very clear on what is right and what is wrong. The Bible is, is abundantly clear, like this is not God's design for you. He loves you and he cares about you. But this is something that you will not inherit the kingdom. I've had a lot of people ask me, is it possible to be a homosexual and to be a Christian at the same time? I've got that question a lot. And I would say this, I believe that a homosexual or a swindler or a drunk or an alcoholic or somebody that's a gossip, or anybody that's a thief, I believe that anybody in this list can come to Christ. But what happens is that over time, these things will disappear in their life. Because God will start that process of making them more like Jesus, and Jesus will call this stuff in their life and say, this has to go. And then the question becomes, are you going to change and follow scripture, 
Or are you still going to do what God, what, what you want to do and not listen to what God wants you to do? The whole point is following scripture. And I know that this is hard for some people to hear, but God loves you and God loves us enough to tell us the truth. God loves us enough to share this. I believe we need to ask this question. What does the Bible actually say about the issue? Not, here's my opinion, and now I'm going to go find a bunch of Bible verses to support my view. What does the Bible say about the issue and about the question that you have? This is very important. Because when we get off base and we, and we stray away from this, there are people that are deceived into thinking they're a Christian. And, and, and I'm not going to make a judgment call like as to what, you know, whether a person is saved or not saved. I'm not the Lord. I'm not going to make that call. I am, let's just say I am concerned. If somebody has been a Christian for 40 years, and for 40 years they have lived in a, a homosexual relationship, or they've been in an adulterous relationship, or they've been a thief, or they've been a, a business cheat for 40 years. Like, I would be concerned for that person's soul because the Bible clearly says that they don't inherit the kingdom. There's always a way back. You can instantly change and instantly repent, and you can immediately come back to the Lord, which is something that I love about the Lord. But I am concerned for people that constantly walk in sin and don't want to listen to God. I'm concerned. And I think we should pray for them. We should pray for them that they turn to the Lord. We'd not, we don't want to approach it in a superior fashion. It was like, yes, I am perfect and you're not whack, whack, quack with my Bible. Like, we don't do that. Sorry for the mental picture. <laughs> we want to approach them with love and with truth. We can't pick and choose what we like and what we don't like a la carte about Jesus and about the Bible because that's not the real Jesus. Now we're forming a God of our own image. We got to be careful of these things. And if, just to let you know, Christian, if you find yourself in this list and it's, it's, it's not something that you struggle with, it's not a sin that you struggle with where you're caught in it and, and you're trying and you're, and you're making like two steps forward and one step back. I'm not talking about that. That's not what this is referring to. But maybe you find yourself in this list and you have not changed, and you find yourself in unchanging, unrepentant sin, that now is the time. Now is the time to make a change. And God will welcome you. Believer, this will be a fight. God wants you to inherit the kingdom. But you need to follow the Lord. Not just pay lip service to the Lord and say, yes, Lord, I love you. But you need to follow the Lord and say, okay, Lord, it's one thing to struggle and say, I know this is wrong and I don't know what to do. And we're here to help you. Like that's what one of the reasons why church exists is to help people in those difficult situations. But you need to say, Lord, I need help. I don't know what to do. And the Lord will get you through that. A lot of us might ask, what if I believe, I, I thought I believed in Jesus and Jesus forgives me. I'm forgiven, right? It's like, but the evidence that you believe in Jesus comes when you want to start following him and what you want to do. It's like this. Let's say that you have a really nasty habit of speeding in your car. Nobody raise your hand. And you know, like, you know that there's this one traffic stop. Actually, there's, there's one, if you come down coal, you know, you come down the hill off, off of coal, like coming up and it's right by the fire station. You guys know what I'm talking about? Great speed trap because you just kind of coast forward and before you know it, you're 10 to 15 over just coasting down the hill. So just let you know, because I love you as a pastor, watch out for that spot. But let's just say for example's sake that you go down that spot and cop pulls you over, says, hey, you were speeding. And you're like, ah, I'm really sorry. And the cop says, you know what? I'll let you off with a warning. And you are so excited. You're happy because you don't have to pay the speeding ticket. That's Monday. Then Tuesday rolls around. You go to the same spot and he catches you speeding again. And you're like, officer, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I don't want to speed. It's really in my heart that I don't want to speed. And the officer says, well, I gave you, let you off with a warning yesterday. I gave you one more warning and that's Tuesday. And then Wednesday comes and then you do the exact same thing. Do you think the cop is going to let you off with a warning again? Uh, no, he's going to say, bro, or if you're a gal, 
hey, <laughs> right? You're speeding. I gave you two warnings. I gave you mercy. Like, why do you keep doing this? You know what that indicates? That you don't value the cop's kindness and mercy. As a Christian, do we value the sacrifice that Jesus gave us on the cross? Or do we use it as a license and use it as an excuse just to keep on doing whatever we want to do? There's a difference in mindset here. It's not that you don't fall into sin, because let's be honest, we all accidentally speed. Some of us accidentally more than others. But you know what I'm saying? Like we all accidentally do something or we fall into sin, or we struggle. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you're struggling with speeding. I don't know. Like, We'll pray for you on that. The thing is that Jesus is not only your hero, but Jesus is also your Lord. Jesus is also in charge. Is he in control of every area of your life and mine? These are questions that we have to ask. Do we value it? Now, I love the next verse in verse 11, because this marks, like all this huge, crazy list, marks so many people at the Church of Corinth because Corinth was a very decadent, very sinful society. And you know what happens? Verse 11, Paul says, And such were some of you. Past tense. There were Corinthians that used to be swindlers. There were Corinthians that used to be homosexuals. There were Corinthians that used to, to commit adultery and sexual immorality. There were Corinthians that used to cheat people out of business. There were Corinthians that used to assassinate people's character on a regular basis. And Paul says, that was the old you. You no longer are that, but you are now following Christ. Verse 11, but you were washed and you were sanctified and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. All sin, and this is important, all sin can be forgiven. Every single one. There's no sin that's too dirty. And the Christians that were saved, they were saved from a lot of sin. And it says that you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified, washed clean of sin. Sanctified, nice theological term, which means that you were separated to be pure or justified. There's this legal standing that you are now perfect in the sight of God. And God's forgiveness should encourage us to move away from what we were given from, not to give us permission to keep on sinning. God wants you to grow. God wants me to grow. And there is grace and there is patience for people that struggle with sin. Because here's the, here's the, here's, here's the secret. We all struggle with sin. Nobody is perfect. Only Jesus. It's the pursuit of Christ and when God brings things to our attention, we have the soft heart to say, okay, Lord, and you change. And there's progress that's being made. Eventually, when you keep turning to God and you keep turning away from sin, which the Bible calls repentance, eventually what happens is that the sin that you were once in is no longer there. I remember when I was in junior high, I had a problem, this, this is kind of funny, but I had a problem with cussing when I was in junior high because everybody else was doing it. And it just kind of, I don't know, but sometimes, and I'm, this is not advoca- I'm not advocating cuss words, but sometimes the cuss word just flows off the tongue. It seems like the right man for the job. You know what I'm saying? But it's not right because that's not what God wants. And I remember talking to God about it. It's like, God, I just want to help. Just help me stop cussing. And, and I kept doing it, but then I would get a little better, then I'd fall back a little bit, but then I kept turning to God. And you know what happened? One day I realized that I had not spoke a single cuss word all day. And I thought, whoa, when did that happen? It's because I kept turning to God and I kept turning to him in all of those things. And eventually what happens is the, the, the temptation just disappears in a lot of respects. For some of us, the temptation might still be there. But temptation itself is not sin. It's giving it to temptation is the sin. And I just have to share, some of us might be tired of fighting. We might be in sin and we're struggling with it. And it's been going on for maybe a while. And we know it's wrong, but we're tired of fighting. We just want to throw up our hands and be like, I give up. I, I, I don't know what to do. And if you find yourself in that situation, I want you to hear like Jesus loves you 
The Bible says a bruised reed he will not, he will not you know, whack over. In other words, that if you are broken, that God is not going to whack you. God wants to help you. And if you're tired of fighting, God wants to give you strength to keep going. And that's what we're here for. We, wanna, we don't want to shame you in these things. We want to support and help you move forward in these things. I believe that if you're tired of fighting, just some practical wisdom, that it's a sign to try something more drastic to get rid of your sin. Jesus speaking, by, allog- by, by imagery, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Now, he isn't saying cut off your hand and gouge out your eye because all of us would be no hands and no eye Christians, right? Like that's what would happen. What he's saying is, is take, do what is necessary to cut it out of your life. Do what you have to. For those of us that might struggle with pornography, the solution might be for you to get a dumb phone now. Because you look at where it's happening and where you're sinning, and you take the steps to get rid of it. You, you look at where am I sinning, and what locations am I sinning, and what are the situations that I'm sinning in, and cut them out of your life. Literally, it's drastic. When we don't change, and when we stop turning to God, and we make that sin a lifestyle choice, and that's where Paul says, heaven is not for you. And that is scary. And I don't want that on anybody. Like I want, I want all of us to turn to the Lord. But be drastic about the sin. If you find yourself tired of fighting, be drastic about it and find others to help you out of it. And that's why we're here to help. We're here to help support you and move forward in those things. And verse 12 and, oh my goodness. Okay, moving on. Verse 12, Paul says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Did you know, Christian, that you have freedom in Christ? It doesn't mean that you have freedom to do whatever you want, but you have been set free in Christ. And we use that freedom to serve the Lord, not do whatever we want to do. We don't want to be dominated or be controlled by anything except God. Sin will control us if we let it. Sin will will control us in how we spend our money. Sin will control us in how we spend our time. Sin will control our schedule. It's crazy how much sin will control you. So we can be careful of that. We don't want to be controlled by anything except the Lord. Verse 13, and food is meant for the stomach and stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Here what, here's what a lot of people at Corinth were saying. It's like, well, because they were trying to excuse their, their immorality. It's like, just like the body needs food, I should give in to my pleasures, right? Like, I should do that. And Paul is saying, "Uh, no, because you could eat a ton of food and be guilty of gluttony, which is kind of the sin that nobody talks about. But, you know, be careful at the buffets today, especially, right? So you want to be careful of that. Just like the food needs body, shouldn't I just give in to my desires? And Paul is like, absolutely not. Because there is a way to go about this. God invented marriage. God invented intimacy for that purpose. Out of that context, it's terrible and it's bad. Verse 14, and God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Our physical bodies will end one day, but all of us that trust in Christ will be raised to life. The physical will go away. Verse 15, and do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? And shall I take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? And Paul says, never. This is a bad idea. Remember the context. Corinth was a, was a center for pagan worship for the, for the goddess Aphrodite. And the prostitutes was part of that ritual. And the practice was common. The immorality was, was extremely common. So as a Christian and as part of a God's family, our physical bodies belong to the Lord. They don't belong to us. Do we treat what belongs to God as if it doesn't belong to God at all? That's the question that Paul is raising. And Paul says, never. Verse 16, or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is written, the two will become one flesh. That's talking about the intimacy thing from Genesis chapter 2. And God created marriage. It was his idea. But when we take God's idea and we try to change it into something else, now it's a fake now, it's a, it's a copycat that doesn't work. 
And Paul says, guys, this is important. Verse 17, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. When you trust in Christ and you're a Christian, you are one with Jesus. And unfortunately, sin can damage this this togetherness and this union. That spiritual connection that you and I have with God is so, so valuable. And so what does Paul say to do? Verse 18, flee from sexual immorality. He doesn't say play with it. He doesn't say take control of it. What does he say? Run, right? Get out of there. Flee from it. There's this in Genesis, Joseph, he was sold into slavery and he's in Potiphar's house. You guys know the story. He, his Potiphar's wife really wanted to sleep with Joseph. And did Joseph hang around? No, he ran. Guys and gals, I'm telling you, we think we can handle it, but we can't. We think we can, can keep sin in a box and put it on a leash and then just feed it every now and then and it'll be fine. And the answer is no, we can't because it will ruin us. It will destroy us. Joseph always ran. He avoided Potiphar's wife. He's like, she would come this way and he'd be like, I'm going this way, right? He would just avoid her completely because he knew she was bad news. Don't dabble with it. Don't play with it. We run from it. Run from those places where we fall into sin and where it's happening and run from the people that cause you to sin and want you to sin with them. That might mean some adjustment of relationships. That might mean cutting off relationships. I don't know. But do what you need to do so that the sin stops. And the reason why it's such a big deal, verse eight, and part of verse 18, every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. You might have heard the phrase, all sin is the same. And we have to ask ourselves the question, is all sin the same? Mm, yes and no. It's the same in the sense that any sin will separate us from God. But not all sin has the same consequences. There are some sins that hurt more than others. And sexual immorality is one of them. And this is a big deal because lying might ruin somebody's trust. Greed might get your focus off of the spiritual things and onto physical things. But sexual sin will ruin your physical body. That's, that's what Paul is saying. And so Christian, this is something that we have to be careful of and we have to watch out for and we need to run from it. Verse 19, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Temples were special locations for religious purposes. And did you know, Christian, that your physical body is a special place for faith to happen. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body has a special purpose. Jesus paid for your life and mine at the cross. Therefore, if Jesus gave his all for you, then shouldn't our response be to give our all for him? This is pretty serious stuff. And I know this is, I know it's kind of a downer, like 1 Corinthians 7 will get better, I promise. But 1 Corinthians 5 and 6 is kind of a downer. But these are very important messages. It's all of God's word. The thing that I really want to focus on and encourage us with is that in verse earlier, when Paul goes through the whole list of the people that won't inherit the kingdom of God. And it's not just sexual immorality. It's people that, that are gossips. It's people that are cheats. It's people that are swindlers. It's, it's, it's a whole nasty crew of people. But Paul clearly says, and I love this phrase, such were some of you. Past tense. Many Corinthians did change and turn to God, despite being in a crazy, sin-filled culture. And my exhortation to you is, we can too. That can be said of us. Such were some of us. And yet God has brought us out of that into life. You need the Lord first. You can't clean yourself up and then come to Jesus. You have to come to Jesus first. 
You need the power of God in your life to make these changes. And God will help you every step of the way. Fellow Christians, body of Christ, we want to help you every step of the way. But you have to come to Christ first. And so if that's you, and you have never given your life to Jesus, or maybe you've heard these things, and there's some serious changing that needs to take place. Number one, God loves you. Number two, God doesn't want to turn you away. I want to challenge and lovingly encourage you that it might be time for you to talk to God and say, God, I've been holding on to this thing for a long time and it's time to let go. I don't know how. Would you please show me the way? And God will show you the way. Amen? Let's stand and let's pray together and prepare our hearts for communion. Father, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you are so gracious and so patient with us. Lord, I pray that if, if there's anybody here that is either stuck and, and struggling with sin, or maybe they've been in a lifestyle of, of these things, and they've heard what you have to say. Not what I have to say, but they've heard what you have to say. And they want to come back to you, and it's time. Lord, I pray that you would do this work. Lord, for those of us that are struggling and we're just tired of fighting, I pray that you would show us what we need to change. Maybe we need to change something drastically. Lord, we thank you that you always love us and that you always care for us. And if you're here today, and if I just want to encourage you during this time of communion, prepare your hearts to, to take it with the right heart before the Lord. If you need prayer, we want to pray for you. If you need help, we want to, we want to help you. If you want to give your life to Christ, I'll, I'll be down here in front. Uh, Daniel will be here. Judy uh, will be here. If you need prayer for anything, we want to help. With, we want to pray for you. And if you want to give your life to Jesus, come and talk to one of us. We want to see you get the best start possible in your relationship with Christ. And if you just need some help, and you, you're at the end of your rope and you realize I'm in that list where God says, I'm not going to go to heaven, but God wants you to go there. It's just time to come to him and start listening to him because he loves you and we love you. We want to help you in that process, in that journey. There's no shame in coming for prayer. Honestly, the people that come in for prayer, I believe are some of the strongest among us because they know that they need help. And we all need the Lord. Lord, we thank you for this time. Prepare our hearts for communion, we pray. In Jesus' name.